I've witnessed it a million times. Some newbie discovers Ford, prints a few stars on the screen, creates a squaring word and now feels capable enough to tackle a full-fledged Ford program. Usually, it doesn't end well. What you get is an intangible mass of stack acrobatics that no sane man will ever attempt to maintain. And that's how Ford got its reputation as a ride-only language. The most frustrating thing is, if you put the same problem in the hands of a seasoned Ford veteran, all those problems seem to disappear. That entire mess of swap, rots and over magically disappears and is converted into a well-organized set of elegant one-liners. Let me be clear, there is no shame in that. It happened to me as well. And even now, over a decade later, I can match the speed but not the compactness of this implementation. No, stack items don't automatically arrange themselves in the most favorable order. I know that Ford proponents like to present the language like that, but it's far from the truth. To write Ford properly you need a certain mindset, and a bit of planning. But first you have to understand how Ford works, and what its limitations are. Now, most languages use variables, either local or global. While Ford has both local and global variables, both are frowned upon. We know the reasons for avoiding global variables. So let's not discuss that one. Some feel that local variables are un like It's a construct that was added quite recently to Ford, and there are still modern Ford compilers that do not support them out of the box. Finally, there are stack operators that treat the stack as an array, which again is considered un like In the thousands of lines of Ford I've written, I've only used them once. I don't recommend their usage if you want to take Ford seriously. So what should we do? We should use the stack. Now let's see what tools we got at our disposal. If you got one single item on the stack, there are no words to move that item. Where to? There's only one single item. There's only one word to copy the item on the stack. Dub. And there's another word to remove the item from the stack. Drop. Now let's see what we got with two items. You can switch the position of the two items by calling swap. Over copies the second item on the stack to the top of the stack. Tuck does the inverse. It copies the top of the stack below the second item on the stack. And finally, nip removes the second item on the stack. Let's continue with three items. Rod moves the third item on the stack to the top of the stack. And that's it. No duplication, no removal, that's all. So we can conclude that access to the first two items on the stack is quite easy, but access deeper into the stack is quite difficult. Increasingly difficult, I might say. And note that whenever you copy an item, you also increase the depth of the stack, so the second item is now the third item, an item that only Rod has access to. Now, you might get a little help from the so-called return stack. That's usually the place where the return addresses reside. But if you're careful enough, you might be able to park a few stack items there. Temporarily. Let's make that perfectly clear. 2R moves the top of the stack to the top of the return stack. Rfetch copies the top of the return stack to the top of the stack. Our from moves the top of the return stack to the top of the stack. It doesn't seem like much, but it makes a big difference, believe me. Now, before we start, I want to make one thing perfectly clear. I'll show you how to implement an algorithm in Ford. But I don't claim it's the only way to do it. I'm not even claiming it's the best way to do it. I've seen quite some people coming up with vastly better solutions. So I won't deny there might be a solution out there that blows this one out of the water. I can only say that this way of approaching the problem works for me. If there are other ways to solve them, tell me about it in the comments. We're going to implement a very fast integer square root routine. In order to understand this algorithm, we've made a uBasic Ford implementation. Needless to say, this one uses variables of course. 
So let's analyze this baby. The Q variable is assigned to 1 straight away and is used throughout the routine. It takes one parameter, the integer whose square root we are looking for. Halfway its value is copied to variable z. As a matter of fact, this copy is completely superfluous. We could have carried on with a fetch and nothing would break. That's one variable down. Halfway variable r is assigned to zero. But if we did that straight away it would be fine as well since it's not referenced. The t variable has quite a limited scope within the second loop. So we better leave it just where it is. So what have we learned? A lot. And here they are. These are all our variables. Now we have to decide where we place them. We don't need variable z, so let's drop this one. But r is quite an active one, so let's place that one on the data stack. The same thing goes for q. On the data stack you go. The parameter seems far better suited for the return stack, since it rarely changes. And let's forget about t for the moment. We'll deal with that one when he comes up. Now, let's tackle the first loop. We got the declaration. Now we initialize and distribute our first three variables. We can simply duplicate q and get a fetch from the return stack in order to evaluate the condition. Unless q is greater than a fetch, we multiply q by 4 and repeat. Let's go to the second loop. We can't forget about initializing r or z since we are already there. The variable q is still the top of the stack, so that's pretty easy. Variable q is then divided by 4, which is a piece of cake. And now we get to a tricky one, let's see. Now variable t has to be calculated, and it gets quite crowded on the stack. If we do it as advertised, we copy r and q and bury them under z, and subtract them both. But we can make our lives a whole lot easier by slightly transforming our expression. We still have to copy r and q. We add and then the j them. Get z and add it to our sum. Now we got three variables on the stack. From bottom to top, r, q and t. If variable t is negative, Nothing happens. We just have to discard it. However, if variable t is not negative, a lot is happening involving just about every variable. To make matters worse, we have to halve the value of variable r, which is now buried under two other variables. But there's a solution. Note, for that this expression, the position of variable r doesn't matter. So we can swap it. That's ok since q plus r equals r plus q, same thing. Now why did we swap q and r? Because we have to divide r by 2, and that's much easier when r is on top. But first we have to evaluate t, so let's do that. If t is less than 0, we have to get rid of it, so let's do that one first. Now r is on the top of the stack, so we can easily divide it by 2, we're done. Let's go to the second branch. We have to replace z by t. z is still located on the return stack, so we retrieve it and subsequently discard it. Then we push t on the return stack. Again, r is on the top of the stack, so we can divide it by 2 with a single word. Since this is done at both sides of the branch, the effect is the same as doing it before entering the branch. Finally, we add q to r leaving q unchanged. We covered the entire conditional now, and then we swap q and r again. But why? Because we've reached the end of the loop, and now we have to reposition r and q, since that's the order in which we started the loop. If we didn't do that, we'd be in a world of pain. Don't make that mistake. Not in a conditional, not in a loop, not after a call, never. Keep the stack neat and tidy at all times. So let's finalize the loop. That's easy. We don't need Q anymore, so let's discard it. We still got variable R on the data stack and Z on the return stack. 
There is added value to z, however, since r squared plus z equals the original parameter. It's a kind of remainder. Ordinary programming languages do have a problem returning several results, but Ford hasn't. So why not use it? You can always discard it if you don't need it. And we're done. We've implemented our algorithm efficiently without too much trouble. So let's see them side by side. What have we learned? 1. Don't resort to local variables or pick and roll without a fight. 2. Study your algorithm closely. 3. Don't be afraid to rewrite your expressions. 4. Plan ahead. Don't just look for what you need right now, take into consideration what you need later. 5. Don't be afraid to retrace your steps and reevaluate your choices. 6. Don't forget to clean up after yourself, no matter whether it's an if, begin, repeat or an entire routine. 7. Be dry behind the ears before you even attempt to write for it. Note, small routines are beautiful since they're so easy to manage. I know what you're thinking right now. Why should anyone in his right mind make this his language of choice? Especially when so many wonderful alternatives like Java and Rust are available. I understand that, but that's a question I hope to answer next time. Okay, at least I'll try. Well, please subscribe if you like this episode and I'll see you next time. I'm Hans Bezmer and this was Back and Forth. Woo!